talk uh, that is from Vanessa Pope from Queen Mary University of London. And we'll be looking at the geometry of storytelling um, and looking at the use of video in theater. So let's go, Vanessa. Thank you. So I'm here to present some work that I did with BBC Research and Development, and I'm hoping to persuade you that theatre practitioners use space in very systematic ways that can be very relevant to 360 video. So the first thing to address is this term of cinematic 360. And that term is often used to refer to 360 content that is beautiful or interesting or narratively rich. The problem with this kind of term is that it implies that the techniques of cinema will translate to 360. And a lot of the ways in which uh, cinema works is it's designed to create a sense of space in a two-dimensional medium. So zooms and cutting between different camera angles, those are all tactics to increase a sense of space. But in 360, we have that baked in. And theatre has been using 360 for a very, very long time. Theatre practitioners are very good at 360. Um, they're used to navigating spatial relationships on stage and navigating that relationship with audiences as well. How many of you have actually produced 360 or been a part of a 360 shoot? Okay, quite a lot of you, so you'll appreciate this. So one of the things that is very important about 360, uh, given the difficulty of editing, it's not impossible, but it's hard, is um, that you want your performers to have the skills of theatre practitioners because you want it in one take ideally. So you want them to remember their lines, remember where they're standing, and hopefully to be able to improvise through any small errors with regards to the wider narrative, so to stay on track. The other thing is about spatial formations. So if there were a 360 camera in the room and I was pointing this way, it would be almost impossible to then rotate that image so that I was pointing in the right direction. So you want your spatial formations to be there in the original because that's very difficult to fix in post-production. So this is a proscenium arch theatre. This is what we tend to think of when we think about theatre performers and the way they use space. But that's just the audience on one side. There are lots of different types of auditorium that have audiences on two sides, three sides. And they're also uh, arena style stages, or also called in the round, where the action takes place in the centre and the audience is around. And this is essentially the inverse of a 360 experience, which has the audience member in the centre and the action taking place around, that, around the viewer. And there are types of theatre practice that do this. You may be familiar with punch drunk, so immersive theatre. There's also a promenade theatre where uh, the audience is taken through a series of scenes or some performance art which is one-to-one. -one. So all of these forms put the audience at the heart of the experience, which is what a lot of 360 also aims to do. So we were interested in conducting a study that looked at the ways in which theatre practitioners use space and to find out whether there were ways that this could be translated into 360 in virtual reality to call on that expertise. So we had two main research questions. The first was around what kind of rehearsal processes the theatre practitioners were using to spatialise a script and to also look at whether different theatre groups use similar spatial tactics when approaching the same script. And then we also wanted to look at whether spatial adaptations were made when the practitioners were transitioning between 360 and theatre. So in order to look at spatial configurations, we needed a theory of space in order to interpret the way space was being used. And we primarily looked at proxemics. And the idea behind proxemics is that every individual has these bubbles of concentric space around them that represent different layers of personal space. So the, the size of these bubbles varies between cultures and in different contexts, but the basic idea is the closer you'll allow someone to you, the more intimate your relationship is likely to be. In order to gather information about the way uh, people were using uh, space and performance, we filmed uh, performers from multiple angles and we used three of these angles, highlighted in green, to triangulate the position of the performers. We put each character in a different t-shirt, so red, green and blue, so that we could chroma key the video footage and extract the coordinates for each actor from every, uh, every frame. And the experimenters sat in a gallery watching the live feed so we could take notes on use of space and also not interfere too much with the rehearsal process. So we had two uh, conditions in the study. They both had the exact same staging configuration. So in the immersive theatre condition, we 
uh, put a swivel chair in the dead space in the center, which you can see is a little circle. And in the 360 condition, we put a 360 camera there. So all of the practitioners that took part in the study had never done 360 before. So we gave a brief 360 training and we um, also gave them the possibility to review footage on a headset so they could get a sense of what it looked like. We had four groups participate. Each group had three actors and one theatre director. And each group performed both conditions uh, in a counterbalanced way. So two of the groups began with 360, two began with theatre, and then they swapped conditions in the afternoon. And we made three recordings in each of those conditions. So we have six recordings of each group performing uh, three times in each condition. Does that make sense? Okay, so in order to look at the way narrative was impacting spatial formations, we needed to have a very particular type of script. So we needed a script that had no spatial indicators because that would somewhat defeat the point. And we needed to have three characters who all had roughly equal speaking parts. We also needed to have changes in social dynamics in the script in order for uh, changes to be visible in our data. In addition, we wanted it to be a, a slightly exaggerated style of script so that we could actually see spatial formations. Eyebrow raising wouldn't really read uh, in the data either. So we commissioned a scriptwriter to write us something, and he came back with a very simple story, six minute scene. Uh, three employees are waiting outside an office, and they know that one of them will be fired. Throughout the scene, each character in turn believes that they're the one that's going to be fired. And then at the end, they come together as a team to um, defeat their employer, basically. So there are three big shifts in social dynamics. And in addition, one character is really sympathetic and sweet, and one is quite cold and mean. So what did we find in terms of the way theatre practitioners approach this? So no matter what, which condition they began in, they all started with a read-through of the script, working with their actors, and they, um, some played theatre games, but they all immediately anchored the physical space that they were in. So despite the fact it was just some tape on floor, they immediately decided where the employer's office was. Uh, many decided where the characters were coming from, and they also added spatial features to the room. So uh, some added an elevator, which could be a potential exit, also a window, which was considered another potential exit. And they also added obstacles inside the space. So they added physical obstacles in the form of chairs, which were also places where the actors could sit. But they also invented uh, imaginary obstacles, like a desk. And all of this was to affect the movement, because without that, the actors were just circling around the camera or the audience member, and it was very unnatural. So they added these obstacles in. So this is an animation that shows the very last recording of each of the four groups. It's a little bit overwhelming because it's sped up, so uh, enjoy. <coughs> so hopefully that gives you a sense of how different the stagings were. Of particular interest, I think, to people who make 360, no matter what condition the theatre practitioners began in, they immediately addressed the problem of the dead space in the centre that was either the viewer or the camera. So they had in-depth discussions about how to do this, and they played around with various solutions. But in the end, two groups settled on the idea that the centre space was an inanimate object or a ghost, and two settled on the idea that the viewer was, in fact, another character, an, um, another employee waiting to find out if they were the one being fired. And you can see that they physically spatialize this by aligning the chairs around that center point to make the viewer physically a part of the action. The other thing that all of the groups did was to add symbolic meanings to the space. So when each character thinks they're going to be fired, there was a recurring line of, oh shit, at which point um, they went to sit down on a chair. So two of the groups, and this wasn't in the script, this was spontaneous. And two of the groups actually referred to the chair as the oh shit chair. And um, one group had a sort of an oh shit corner, which is where they went when they found out that they were going to be fired. In terms of the way uh, they spatialized narrative themes, the most striking similarity across all of the groups was the way they, um, they expressed the togetherness at the end of the scene. So all four groups use physical contact between the characters. Here are two groups that used um, hand-holding or touching, and here are two groups that used a huddle around the middle. And you can also see this in the 
in the data. So all of the groups on average uh, dropped their mean interpersonal distance at the end of the scene where they come together as a team. And this suggests that some of proxemics might be applying to the way narrative is being spatialized. Earlier I mentioned characters with different levels of empathy. We found that the most empathetic character was significantly closer to the center, to the viewer, than the other characters. And we also found that the characters who were most at odds, so the blue and the red character, had significantly greater interpersonal distances than uh, the other characters. When they transitioned between 360 degree and theater, we did find some differences because they were reviewing on the headset and able to make some decisions on that. There were significantly smaller angles in 360, and the reason for this is the headset that they were reviewing the footage on had a, a field of view of about 96 degrees, so much smaller. So in order to uh, make scenes with two or three people visible, they needed to cluster much closer together. We also found smaller distances to center in the 360 condition. And the actors and directors explain this through uh, the physical presence of someone in the swivel chair. So again, this is connected to proxemics, but they didn't want to invade the personal space of a physical person in the middle, but they were much more comfortable coming right up close with the camera. We were very lucky in that the final group that took part in the study did um, 360, rehearsed for theater, and then specifically requested to have another 360 shoot because they wanted to see what would happen. So we have a direct comparison, and we know exactly what they did when they adapted that footage. This was not part of the experimental design, but a great bonus. So you can see that when they moved to 360, they huddled around the camera rather than including it, and they also moved the chairs closer to squeeze the action together. So this is an animation that uh, shows you how they moved in both of those conditions. So the 360 condition has tighter spatial formations, but you can also see that there is, there is a system. They plan this. Um, they're using very similar formations in both, except for at the end there, where they huddle separately. Right, so hopefully I've persuaded you that there is method to the madness of theatre practice. There are systems in place. There are things that 360 can take away uh, from theatre practice. And also, uh, hopefully this has also shown you the richness of the ways that space can be used for narrative purposes and something that we can take away and use in our content. The use of proxemics in this study was purely as a tool to understand what the theatre practitioners are doing. It's by no means a way of establishing rules for the correct way of expressing a story. It's just a tool. And 360 is probably just the beginning of spatialized recorded media. We may soon be able to record scenes and then walk through them. So it, this is a great time to get on board and build on existing practices and develop new ones for the future. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This was a great talk, very inspiring, and I really like your graphics too. I'm Tanya Aitamorto from Stanford University, and I was curious about your, the, the point where you started your talk from. So you <clears throat> made this question that is 360 video, is it cinematic? So I, I would like to hear more your answer to that. Is it cinematic, and if so, in what type of conditions? Oh, uh, so I'm a theater person, not a cinema person, which <laughs> influences this. Um, I think that there is a camera, it's recording, but I would argue that it's not cinematic because you can't control the viewer's gaze and the language of cinema is about controlling the viewer's gaze in creative and exciting ways. And it's not better or worse than a theatrical approach, I just think it's less appropriate. The other thing is that 360 cameras often have lower resolution than the type of cameras you'd use in cinema, so delicate facial expressions and tiny details and beautiful cinematography won't read very well in 360 at the moment. That might change. But. Hi, uh, Mark, uh, Jerusalem Academy of Art, mostly. Uh, was there a sense of, especially for, for the swivel chair case, that the actors were calling for the attention of the viewer? Yes and no. So in that last um, example that I shown you, I showed you with the, the direct comparison, the theatre director specifically, the instructions he gave to the performers in that two minute turnaround were uh, moving the chairs closer, come really close to the 360 camera, and remember where I looked when, when we were doing it in the theatre condition, and make sure you don't pull attention. 
Don't so, so they, oh. so they were, they were negotiating that. And one of the things that was very useful is that uh, when they were rehearsing for theatre and had someone there moving, the performers got a sense of where they should be when they should be pulling attention and when they should be contributing to the scene. But they were always active. Thank you. So I'll ask a question here. Uh, Frank Bentley from Yahoo. Um, I was wondering if you had any of the audience members actually watch the 360 videos that were produced and if there was any difference or what they thought of the experience from sitting there on the chair versus watching it uh, on a headset. So we didn't actually have any audience members participate in the study. The reason that there is always someone in the swivel chair is that I think one the, on, in the first um, the first theatre run through the theatre director didn't sit in the chair, but for the rest of the time they were always in the chair. We didn't we uh, asked them to rehearse for that scenario, and we also didn't do any kind of evaluation. On